All right, here we go. We have a Detroit legend in the building, Jalen Rose. Welcome to Vlad TV. What up, though? And congratulations. I feel like I arrived. I asked you before we started, how many years you've been doing this? You said 11. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on your movement. And you actually reached out early, I remember. Yeah, you DM'd me on Twitter. We no were talking doubt. about doing something. Yes, indeed. And some years later, yes, indeed. here because we are. You know, as the social media boom started to happen and YouTube clips started to become something that uh, people were making popular, I saw you making moves in that space. I was doing it too. Started my little Jalen TV at the time. I had my thing going as well. Mm. Then just graduated into now working for ESPN. Yeah, man, congratulations. Like, people are lucky to get a few years in professional sports and that's it. You had a long run in the NBA and then flipped it into an even longer run in television. So congratulations. Man. Thank you. I am, in in my world, this is, uh, I'm celebrating 30 years. Wow. I'm celebrating uh, the 13 years I got a chance to, to play in the NBA. You know, the three years I got a chance to play at the University of Michigan, mm -hmm. which were terrific, being a member of the Fab Five, the four years in high school. Mm -hmm. And then now working for ESPN, this is what my 11th year. Wow, and I've been covering the finals since 2003 when it was the Lakers and the Nets. New Jersey, they weren't even in Brooklyn. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. So, you know, I saw your movement, and I appreciate you supporting mine, but uh, it's what we do. Yeah, well, let's get into it. It's your first time here. You were born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Born in the 70s, so you grew up in the 80s. Mm. Uh your father wasn't just a basketball player, but he was a first-round draft pick. Correct. But you guys had never met. Mm -hmm. What exactly happened there? So my father, uh, my biological father, Jimmy Walker, was the number one pick in the 1967 NBA draft. Just had Earl de Pearl Monroe on Jalen and Jacoby recently, who was also in the draft. Yep. Love Clyde Frazier, um, who was also in that draft. And so... He and my mom weren't clearly in a relationship. And so when I was born, it was more so I was used to – it's almost like you don't miss what you never had. Okay. So being the youngest of four, having a different father from my brothers and sisters, and growing up, like you said, in Detroit, unfortunately, it seemed like it was commonplace for there to be a single parent in a home. So I didn't feel like I was missing anything. Right. But, you know, people have kids out of wedlock mm -hmm. and, you know, things happen, people move around, but he knew who, he, it's not like he didn't know who you were until later in life. He has this son who becomes a McDonald's All-American and then becomes part of the Fab Five and then joins the NBA when he himself was a star NBA player. Why, why was there not, no connection to at least, hey, he's following in my footsteps, he's doing even better than I did, like... I think he had a level of shame mm -hmm. attached to the fact that he didn't know one of his kids and probably didn't have the best relationship with allegedly a lot of his other kids also. Oh, okay. And so being somebody that was so very successful at what he does, and, and, and for those people who get a chance to follow college basketball, he's one of the greatest performers ever to do it. You know, some of the greatest performances at the Garden were Jimmy Walker when he played at Providence. Okay, and so there was a reason why he was the number one pick. And I was, I, this is a long time ago. Master P had just started working with Snoop. I remember this because I was uh, staying in L.A., had a spot in Santa Monica at the time. They was, uh, P, it's my family, congratulations on this film, had just came through and kicked it. And he had left. I remember having a remote control in my hand upstairs at the spot. Flipped it to the 1972 All-Star game. Saw my father in the game. Mm -hmm. It was just like really bugged out. I was like by myself, made it to the NBA, um, achieved my goal, my dream. And all of a sudden, boom, this is wow. Look, it's almost indirectly looking in the mirror because my brothers and sisters, you know, they're not, you know, collegiate or high school big time athletes. And so he's out there with Chamberlain, Jerry West, Dave Bing, 
who's also my godfather. And so understanding what he got accomplished and being young, knowing that I was bitter, like all youngsters would be. I had his basketball card. I knew about his legacy. I uh, knew that he wore number 24. So being young and out of spite, and at the time immature, in high school I wore number 42. Yeah. Like I'm gonna I'm do the opposite. Like I'm gonna make sure not only I'm gonna ball and win state championships and stuff like that, but he's gonna know my name one day. And it ultimately became a motivating factor. Well, you guys actually spoke on the phone at some point. We did. How was that conversation? We did. I was playing for the Pacers. I was at Dale Davis's house. Austin Crozier, who was also my teammate at the time, attended Providence. And I think he had some sort of tie with the athletic director. And he reached out to him just trying to represent on my behalf and, and got a phone number for me. And so he gave me the phone number. And he what he didn't realize is I'd been walking around with a letter that Mitch Album gave me the night before we played Carolina in a championship game. So that's 94. So I've been walking around with this letter directly and indirectly for seven to eight years that he had written for me. And I just felt like I wasn't going to open it until I felt like I was emotionally stable for whatever was going to be inside of the letter. You had an unopened letter for eight years. I did. Wow. Absolutely. My, my third year in college and my first handful or so years in the league. And when I felt like I made it, in my mind, not the rest of the world, when I looked in the mirror and was like, I I'm confident enough to whatever's going to be in this letter, I'm ready for it. So... We were at the house, they were playing poker. I like to watch poker, hang out with my peoples that do, but for some reason I just never tried to play. Now I play some spades or some craps or something like that, but that's another subject. So I'm like, I got this letter, I got this number. I'm about to go call him. So I walk, I walked in the back, go, you know, Dale's my guy, I walk to the back and whatever. I call one number. Um, a really gracious lady answers the phone and uh but she was like, he's, you know, th this is not a good number to contact him anymore. So I didn't know what their relationship was like. I didn't want to pry any further, but I appreciated the fact that she gave me another number to call. And that led me to, um, I think, get a chance to speak to one of his sisters. And so she was kind of telling me a history of what she knew about the situation. She was telling me that, uh, you know, their mom had died, and unfortunately he didn't make it to the funeral. Um, I remember running to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar at a basketball game. He was like, yo, I used to go by your grandmother's house. She used to have amazing cooking, you know, that type of thing. You know, older NBA players just kind of showing me love as somebody that they saw coming up um, by one of their brethren. And so uh, understanding, you know, his his history and his lineage and our disconnect, I feel like, all right, I'm mature enough, I'm about to go call. And so I'm on the phone with her, and she's like, well, I'm, he allegedly has 13 kids by 11 women. Hmm. Okay. Um, allegedly, again, if I'm one or two, four or five off, this is all just all speculation that as a – 46-year-old man learning things about my father along the way. These are some of the kind of urban legends. No shots and no shade. I wouldn't be 6A playing in the NBA and have no, you know, negative energy towards him at all. None. I wanted life. Um, and so she was like, but I got another number for you to call. Okay, this is the third number now. Yeah, this is the third number. Feel free to reach out to me. You know, whatever. She gave me a number. A lady answered. She was like, hold on. I was like, heart start pumping. He got on the phone. I was just like, this is Jalen. Thank you for taking my call. Because, you know, I have that energy since this is the third number I've called. And, again, this is this is... 
before, like, young people probably see this now. Like, you think about social media or why you ain't just DM them or why you ain't just text them. Like, the whole phone situation was way different. All, this is when people that. was using landlines. Right. Okay. Uh, cordless phone was a big deal back <laughs> yes, then, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so when I finally got him on the phone, I appreciated him being on the phone because I'm pretty sure that he probably anticipated I was going to call at some point or maybe he didn't. And I just told him thank you. I told him I loved him. I told him I would look forward to meeting him. And he was really um, he was really humble. He was like, um, he just wanted me to know that at no point in my life did he want to come and just try to act like, you know, he was going to take credit for what I accomplished mm -hmm. or be a distraction for me in any way, shape, or form. And he really scoffed at the notion that a book was being written about me and that I got a letter from him the night before the biggest game that I ever played in, which was also in the letter. Which you hadn't read it at the point of talking to him. I'm holding it in my hand. Gotcha. So he's giving me the gospel that he basically writ had written eight years ago about how he just didn't like the, how the whole process had played out while I was in college. He felt like I was being exploited by the entire book situation. He felt like he was being exploited because as it went on, as we now see to become a bestseller and all of the great things that the book has accomplished, you know, I, I guess his foresight was accurate when he gave that depiction. He was, a uh, how, how tall? Jimmy Walker was 6'3", 6'4", which was considered a big guard. Okay. Did any of your other siblings end up playing in the NBA? Did any anyone else get the height that you got? I am the tallest person in my family. Okay. Still to this day. So whatever gene pool that yeah. I helped inherit, and again, I'm not his only son. Right. That's what I'm saying. But for whatever it, for whatever it was meant to be, somebody somebody above was looking down on me. You hit the lottery. Yeah. I guess um, I hit the genetic lottery. He ended up passing in 2007 mm -hmm. uh, from lung cancer. He was 63 years old. Did you attend his funeral? I did. Uh -huh. Did you get to meet a bunch of your other family for the first time at that point? Well, Vlad, this was one of the uh, colder days in my life that became a learning experience that I want all young people to understand, like, we grew up in the neighborhood with this live fast, die young mentality and or um, get rich or die trying. And so being at his funeral with one of the top 50 players in the history of the NBA, Dave Bing, my godfather, their, his former teammate, who at times when my father hit hard times, allegedly lived with Dave while they were in the league, okay? Wow. okay? So I'm at the funeral with him. It was probably a total of 20 people there. Not a, not a big, huge outpouring, okay. I was like, whoa. Really intimate. Because if you think about it, something can happen to an infant, something ha can happen to somebody elderly, Somebody can happen to whoever at what phase in life. You would hope that it's more than 20 people there to pay respects. Now, I didn't Especially know. Especially with 11, well, 11, wait, 13 kids? Allegedly. Yeah, allegedly 13 children who have families of their own and everything. Yeah. But also just somebody that was so very accomplished in his own right. Correct. Um, and so that gave me a level of clarity that... Whatever path that that was or whatever generational curses may exist that I'm tied to being clearly an offspring, I just want to try to be better at those phases in my life. But I was there to say thank you. I was there to pay homage and uh, no regrets at all about going. One regret, though, for everybody out there who is estranged from my parent. Those are the only you those are probably the most unique relationships you're ever going to have because you'll have other siblings, you'll have other friends, you have other cousins. You, you get one biological mother, one biological father, and you don't choose them. Right. 
right? And so there are some situations where you're just unable to make it right. But if you're able to make it right, try to make it right. And so one of my regrets is I didn't get a chance to see him before he passed. And I was going to do it. He died in 2007. That's the year I retired. And so I was working the NBA playoffs, and I was like, as the season ended with the, with the, with the playoffs, the draft, free agency, I was like, I'm going to go to Kansas City and see him. Never happened. Though. Never got a chance to do it. Well, it's quite a quite a story. That's a movie in and of in and of itself, right there. But you definitely got through it, and uh, you accomplished. I, I feel greater things than your father. Well, you grew up in Detroit, and which at one point I think when you were really young was a thriving city. Mm -hmm. The the car makers were there, and everyone had jobs and homes. Then the car manufacturers moved away and then crack hit, kind of around the same time. Did you get to see the city just start to buckle under that pressure? I did, and I, you ask any person that's elderly what they would take if they could have a choice for anything in their life. They wouldn't say money, they would say youth. They would wanna be younger. That's why that, that there's a phrase that sometimes youth is wasted on the young. And so being a, somebody that was born in 1973, I got a chance to not only witness the birth of hip hop and see all of the changes that has taken place since that period of time, from when the first records were made, the same thing with my hometown. One that was really thriving to the point where we had 1.5 to 2 million people in Detroit. Now we approximately have 600,000. Wow, a third. Okay, and that dynamic of everybody, you hope each major city has something that they're proud of. And what comes up when you hear about Detroit? Music, Motown, mm -hmm. it's thriving, Barry Gordy, the auto industry. Yep. I'm, I'm, a, a, I'm a direct impact from that. My mother worked at Chrysler over 20 years. My, one of my uncles, Paramore, rest in peace, worked at Ford over 30 years. My uncle Leonard worked at GM over 30 years. My grandfather, Paramore Hicks Sr., worked at the plant for over 30 years. That was Detroit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe a high school diploma, get a job at the plant, willing to work 40 weeks, get the time and a half, get the double time, buy a car on the A plan save $10,000, be able to live in a thriving neighborhood, which was the inner city at the time. Mm -hmm. A lot of businesses were black owned. And Detroit became a hub for a lot of people that were migrating from the South. They were like, okay, we're trying to leave um, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, get to Detroit, where we know that it's thriving. And so I remember feeling like Detroit was the heartbeat or one of the more prouder places in the United States of America to be because we were thriving. We had the, I think we're the first city to have a black mayor, Coleman A. Young. And uh, I, I remember a sea change as he did an interview, I think it was with like NBC back in the day. And they were talking about how the changes were starting to happen in Detroit and crack was starting to kick in during the Reagan era and stuff like that. And he kicked them out of his office on live TV. And so being a Detroiter, we took pride in like, you know, okay, you know, people want to kick us while we're down type of thing. But that crack e epidemic in the 80s was something way different that none of us had seen before. And... It hit most inner cities. It hit Detroit as hard as any place in the country. You became a McDonald's All-American basketball player in high school. So I'm assuming that people recognize very early your immense athletic ability. Like at what point, like how, how old were you when people were like, okay, Jalen is about to go all the way with this? So it, 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 there's two dynamics when you grow up in the inner city. It's I love basketball but it takes a really long time 
for that dream to pay off, mm-hmm. right? I didn't start playing in the NBA for a dollar till I was 21. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I idolized Magic, Deion Sanders, Muhammad Ali. Idolized them. But as a youngster in Detroit, I also idolized Young Boys Incorporated. I also understood that there was a street element that was totally taking place also. And what you learn really fast is back then, if you was about that life, you could come on be about this life. But if you ain't about this life, you should probably continue to go to school, play basketball, and do your thing. And fortunately for me, that's how it was for me. Growing up, 10 toes down, Puritan and Apolline, okay? And so I had the streets and the neighborhood basically protect young, talented basketball player that was at Butso, that was at Northwest Activity, that was at St. Cecilia. And everybody that's on the floor ain't a high school player, you know, or a potential collegiate player. Some of the best players are the ones who not playing on their high school team that ended up making, you know, decisions that stopped them from being eligible or just feeling like I'm going to go with the street life. And so... I, I was able to kind of tight rope um, balancing between the two because the other thing is when you really don't have money, you don't control your environment. You don't control where you live. You don't control when you eat. You don't control what you necessarily wear. But I'm seeing everybody else getting fresh. Yeah. Starter coats, nanny, nanny goats, sheepskins. I'm like troop jackets. Yeah, I'm like I, I remember that era. Yeah, I'm Gazelles, like Gazelles. Like yeah, you're wearing now. Boom. <laughs> so now what I do is so funny. I always buy the things that I necess- couldn't necessarily get when I was young. Yeah. So you see me now Puma down to the socks. You see me with the Gazelles on because that's what I always wanted. Yeah. Now you can afford it. Correct. <laughs> Watching Lee and Beach Street. I'm like I need that. <laughs> so. You were basically protected by the drug dealers. Mm-hmm. Did you yourself ever witness or get caught up in anything yes. during that time? Yes. Or what was yes. the worst thing? Well, here's the, here's what it is. It's happening on your block. Yeah. It's happening next door to you. It's happening down. The, it's happening everywhere you go. It's happening when you're not on the court, or when you're not in the classroom. You live in a an environment that exposes you to so many things, sex, drugs, violence, gangs, that a young mind has to take in so very early. You know, seeing people 11, 12 years old already drinking and smoking. You know what I'm saying? 40 ounces, Mad Dog 2020, Cisco, all of that. And so, of course, you like, hey, sometimes it's a fine line between I'm about to be this great student in school and I'm this great basketball player. At some point you you still on the block. Right. And so yes, I've I've been around scenarios where you know there was there was weed, there was drugs, there was alcohol, there was crack. I've had people in my family addicted to it. Um I've had one of my siblings addicted to drugs, I have another one of my siblings addicted to alcohol. Who are both clean, at least for the last 15 years or so. So I really got a chance to be up close and personal with it. And obviously having friends and people my age and obviously the cast that were older exposing you to it. So based on your ability, you got put into a private school, right? In high school. No, no. This was earlier? No, that was Chris Weber went to Detroit Country Day. Okay, you I went to you, Detroit Southwestern. Okay, you went to public school. Went to a public school. Ah, gotcha. My so, bad. so no, but but you're you you're right track, wrong train. So, <laughs> I got a chance to go to Saint Cecilia in sixth and seventh grade because I could play basketball. Okay, so that was junior high. Correct. Okay, I got it mixed up. And so I used to catch the bus, 
do whatever I had to do to get there. Mom used to drop me off sometime. But that's, that's the heartbeat of basketball as well. So that became almost an incubator for me able to, when you ain't in school, you could be in the gym. When you go back to your block, you know, everybody doing what they were doing before you left. And I remember, you know, my brother, my, oh, I got two older brothers and an older sister, and my brother used to always tell me as motivation. He was like, you ain't, meant, like, because sometimes I'd be like, man, I just want to stay on the block, man. Because whatever season it was is what sport we played. So it wasn't just like, I'm tall, I'm good at basketball, let's always play basketball. It ain't work like that. Right. During football season, I played football for St. Cecilia for two years. Sam Washington, the, the all-time great. He helped make so many people uh, change so many young lives in Detroit. I played baseball at Hutchinson Middle School. I broke, I, 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 I break danced. You okay. know, we had the cardboard. We ordered breakers only. You yeah. know, the uh, Izod windbreakers. You know, for the head spin, all of that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, being a student that got a chance to go to school and be exposed to what basketball could do for me was at St. Cecilia. Sam Washington brought me into the office. I'm, I'm goofing around trying to talk to girls or whatever. And uh, we had a, uh, yeah, this was that year. <laughs> it's funny. So I did a. Uh, I can't live without my ring. I was LL Cool J in the school play, right? I think uh, take a muscle bomb man and put his face in the sand. That song. Mm -hmm. I'm bad. Yeah, I'm bad, right? And I was feeling myself that day, too, because I still had the can go on. I had the fake gold tooth that you bought, you know, <laughs> around the corner. I took my little ID picture of my fake gold tooth. I was feeling myself that day. He pulled me to the side. He's like, let me show you something. He had a little, like, dusty projector in the basement. He dusted it off, like, show me doing a spin dribble. I'm like, who is that? He's like, that's your father. He's like, I'm never going to call you Jalen until you deserve it. And at that point, he only called me Rose. He never called me Bum. And so it's ironic that now this is a common name that my mother made up. That's another subject for another day. But... He was like, you have so much potential in you, and I'm seeing you blow it. Hmm. You got a chance to do something special, and basketball can take you there. And I started to take the game serious. I started to sign my autographs, Dr. J. Hmm. I was like, yeah, I'm going to the league. I had irrational confidence. So anybody that has known me since I could speak would be like, he always said he was going to the NBA. Well. Then you get to high school and you become a McDonald's All-American, mm -hmm. which kind of puts you on, on the traje trajectory to the NBA. Not everyone that becomes a McDonald's. 85% 85 of McDonald's, yeah. That's what I'm saying, 85%. That's a great ratio. Excellent ratio. <laughs> so you're now a superstar in high school. And then you go to Michigan. And that's when the Fab Five forms. These days, you occasionally see you know, five incredible freshmen. But back then, there was no such thing. It was really special. And, and the great thing about that opportunity to be a member of the Fab Five with Juwan Howard, now the head coach at University of Michigan, Chris Weber, Jimmy King, and Ray Jackson, is that coming from high school, for those that don't know, I went to Detroit Southwestern. That's one of the most legendary programs in the history of basketball. My high school coach, Perry Watson, is one of the greatest to ever do it. So my initial basketball sacrifice was, quote, unquote, to go to Southwestern because I lived on the northwest side and the school's in southwest Detroit. So now you're committing basically to take almost the longest bus so the, the bus starts at 8 Mile. I'm getting on at 6 Mile. It ends at Fort Street. That's where the school is. All right? And so to play for Perry Watson in my freshman year, play JV. Howard Isley, now coaching at Michigan. Voshan Leonard. People before me, Anderson Hunt, Final Four MVP at UNLV. So many, Antoine Joe Bear, like legendary program. 
when I went there, I was like, I'm going to the league. And so for us to win a couple of city championships, PSL, state championships, we won national championship. So my senior year, going to Michigan, I'm like, all right, I have a chance to go to UNLV where Anderson Hunt starred. I took a visit there. Go to Syracuse where Derek Coleman starred. By the way, come home every year giving me the long shorts. Planting the seed here, giving me the long shorts. I took a visit to Michigan State, Steve Smith. That's where he start. You pick a school based on where your big brothers are, and you say, somebody from Detroit went there and had success, maybe I can too. And I didn't wear number five in high school. As you know, I wore 42. The reason why I changed my number in college is because I was the fifth member to sign his letter of intent. That's how I got number five. And so to be able to join up and play with those guys, it was no egos. That's what allowed it to happen in the early 90s at a time where usually people was picking schools to try to go put in, put in work and go to the league. And you and Chris Webber had a long relationship already. Mm -hmm. So the first year the Fab Five with all freshmen go to the NCAA championships. That is crazy. It's never happened before. <laughs> it never happened again. And you guys hated Duke. Yeah. Despised them. You actually called the black players at Duke house Negroes. <laughs> that was the young me speaking. Yeah. This was the inner city kid from Detroit that felt like I wasn't getting an opportunity based on my zip code and the, the, the financial standing of my family. But you were in a fairly high opportunity situation at that time, though, weren't you? I mean, you were going to the NCAA finals, you know, in a spectacular team. And, and, when, and when the season ended in April and May, I was right back in the hood. Mm, gotcha. Staying at my mother's crib that I grew up in. Gotcha. The same environment. The, whole, the entire world gets to see me on the big stage, rocking the big shorts, Black shoes, black socks, people naming their kids Jalen, that's now in the NFL or the NBA, people rocking the Harachis, right back on the block. That made you bitter. Of course it did. <laughs> right, you kind of singled out Grant Hill, who came from a, a rich family, college-educated parents, I think his dad played professional sports. Yeah, Calvin Hill was a beast. Yeah, and you were just jealous of him, basically. Yeah, I was jealous. And so it's, it's almost like uh, the movie Face Off. Uh, who is it? Uh, John Travolta and Nicolas Cage in that movie, right? Uh, or even like uh, another one like Ricochet. I remember Denzel was in a movie kind of like that. Where, it was, where it's like you see somebody, you're, 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 the, you're the A or the B side, however you see it. And you see somebody that has all of the things that you want. And you ready for this, Vlad? And then you think they're soft because you grew up in the hood and you poor, right? This is what I learned a long time ago. Your haircut, how you wear your pants, how you speak, your appearance, that don't make you hard. And by the way, it don't mean nothing to be tough anyway. So we felt like that about them. We 13 and under at, in St. Louis playing AAUs. We scrapped up all of the money we could do to get our Patrick Ewing conductor um, Adidas to wear them as a team. They come running out there, rest in Virginia, full uniforms on, fresh kicks on, families in the stands. We like, we about to crush them, Detroit. Like, and we was up till three in the morning. They ran us. Beat us by 30, beat the brakes off of us. And I was like, Grant Hill, he about to be one of the greatest to do it. And if he not, so like people are compare, talking about Zion a lot this year. And I think he's going to be a terrific player. The best player, the most talented player ever at Duke is Grant Hill. The most accomplished player is Christian Leitner. 
And so the, I got a chance to play against those guys on the same team with Bobby Hurley and Coach K. So we just felt a level of, I, I'm speaking for me, growing up from an, in an inner city environment, it, it, it was always, you know, how can I find a level of motivation? And so, yeah, playing against those guys, we said some things that were immature and irresponsible that came out in the documentary as we were speaking about our young selves. And now I have people looking at me like I'm 40-year-old man and I'm mad. I'm like, that was, that's what made the documentary great is because we were honest. Right, because you called uh, Christian Leitner an overrated pussy. That's how we felt. Until you actually played him. Boom! <laughs> right? Like he got game. Going baseline, dunking on us. He only went to four Final Fours. I know, right? Right? <laughs> only mean, four. Right? Right? A couple of championships, a couple of most outstanding players. Like, again, as a trash-talking player, as somebody that needed to be irrationally confident to try to you know, uh, get from the bottom of the ladder. You you're gonna you're gonna have to rub you're gonna have to you're gonna have to uh, ruffle some feathers to sometimes get where you want to go. Well, here I am right now. I'm wearing black sneakers and, and black socks. <laughs> you know, and long, long shorts. And me too. <laughs> and by the way, Puma. Right. I wish I could have did it with Nike, but you know. <laughs> And honestly, if you look at my wardrobe, I own no white socks. <laughs> uh, and I mostly wear black sneakers. And damn near all the time, I'm wearing long shorts. And I'm thinking it's just because I'm so fashionable. I didn't realize that you were the reason <laughs> <laughs> why I dress like this. Because you guys were the first ones to wear <laughs> these outfits in the NBA. You had these really short shorts before that everyone would wear. You guys came in with longer shorts and black socks that only old men would wear. <laughs> and it just took off. Correct. And um, the interesting part, because I just watched the documentary before, before our interview today. You guys went down to the local Foot Locker one day and you saw Nike Fab Five sneakers. We did. Of which you guys had absolutely no part of. None. No financial incentive. Zero. Nothing. So all these trends and all this impact you guys made you had zero dollars to show for it. That's why I applaud player empowerment on and off the floor these days, because not only are the players today bigger, stronger, faster, and more talented. I know some old guys out there like, <laughs> in my day, in my day, you went between the legs behind the back shooting from 35. It was only a few people doing that. Right. Okay. Now, just the game, the, the game is different. But that understanding of business, you saw it play out this summer in the NBA. All of the top players already had championships. So they weren't just choosing teams or choosing loyalty. They were making business moves. Yeah. And so... Imagine if that transition happened in the early 90s. We would own all things Fab Five. I don't know if you could patent long shorts or black shoes or black socks or however you do it or trademark it. Same with the, every, all of the merchandising. Mm -hmm. Imagine, so LeBron now owns his brand. Smartly. In the early 90s, we didn't own the brand. So there was a level of frustration when you go see the Hirachi being resold and restocked two and three times. And you see all of this merchandise, and you're like, man, I'd love to get two or three pairs of them in different colors and rock them too. And also that creates a level of hunger, like, wow. But you know what else it did for me too, Vlad? It showed me the difference between fame and money. Because a lot of times, especially now, people think you, you on IG, if you post it on IG, people think you got it. People see you with it on TV, they think you own it. Yeah, uh, Suge Knight, in, in that last documentary that came out, American Nightmare, said that most entertainers 
just want to be famous and have enough money to pay their bills. That, that struck me because I've always been the opposite. I didn't want to be famous, and I wanted as much money as I could get. Yes, <laughs> which is yes. why I'm behind the camera. Right, because they're both they're both drugs. Yes, fame and money are both drugs, mm -hmm. and there are people that can juggle both, that aspire to have both, that thrive on having both. But then there are others that's like oh, fame, oh, I see some money, you know, because because for me, if I could have all of the money in the world and walk down the street and nobody knew who I was, that would be perfect. Yeah, exactly. Right? I, I would. That, that's my motivation right there. <laughs> right? That would, be, that would be ideal. And so in that instance, I'm like the entire world knows who I am. But you're broke. But I don't have anything. I'm, I'm st you couldn't even stay in your dorm during the off season. Now you can do that. Mm. When the season ended, I was back at the crib. <laughs> I, like, uh, I'm back on the block. So like 30, 40 minutes away is, is close enough but far enough. It was, it, it's a weird dynamic. Well, during, during your career in Michigan, there was an incident where you were hanging out with some friends back mm -hmm. in Detroit. I guess the cops raided the house and they found some drugs in the house. Yes. Including some crack. Yes. And it turned into a whole thing. It did. This was called the quote unquote crack house incident. Correct. Even though it wasn't a crack house. So, and, 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 and we, we have to embody a period of the 80s and 90s where if you're in the inner city, somewhere like Detroit, where drugs, homicides have infiltrated the community, that's in almost every home, sadly. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so you don't have to, it's almost which house doesn't have it affect them. It's, it's almost like we can relate to what cancer can do and the effects it can have on devastating a family because it's something that everybody has been exposed to. That's how this scenario was. A friend of mine who went to high school, who I went to high school with, I think his, his mom or his grand, his mom died. She left him the house. Anybody that's ever hung around people 18 to 25, that's the hangout now. That's all. That's the hangout. Playing Madden, hang, hanging out with girls, um, doing what? High school, college age kids, young adults do. Having adult beverages, all of that. Rolling up a couple. <laughs> this is just yeah, regular. It's just regular. And so now all of a sudden, knock at the door, Sunday morning. I remember I'm sitting there playing. I used to use the Giants on Madden because not too many people use them, but I could. Had Everson Walls on one side, picking it off, LT, pass rush. Anyway, knock on the door. One of the homeboys get up and go get the door. And uh, I think he had one of those uh, uh, security doors where you just have to, you need a key to kind of get in type of thing. So they didn't, they didn't barge down the door per se. He was like, uh, the police at the door. And me, I'm... Let me, what, can we help y'all? Oh, this is a raid, da da da. We like, come on in. I unlocked that door. They came in like, woof. It was like about 20 of them. I look out on the grass. It was a, a, a cleaner's van, like this unmarked like van. It had like some phony cleaner stuff on the side. They had the first couple of dudes just kind of like ran past us with their weapons drawn, I guess, to go secure the back, you know, and then secure the middle and then secure the front type of thing. It's like about four or five of us in there. We like, I don't know, I'm like, what are you, like, this a raid, whatever, whatever. We like, like y'all wasting y'all time. If y'all got some money, y'all should bring it to us. We trying to get it. And so um, they, Tearing up the house, they knifing the uh, the furniture, 
taking everything out of the refrigerator, taking everything out of the freezer, tearing up the house. Didn't find nothing. Nothing. They started checking us all afterwards. Boom, check me. Da, 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 da. Oh, my son loves you. Da, da, da. I know who you are. Whatever, whatever, whatever. Oh, he's going to be disappointed for two reasons. One, I'm supposed to be spending my Sunday with him. And two, I'm getting a chance to run into you in here. Oh, man. So he go down the line, da, 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 da. And then he frisk another one of the dude. He like, oh, we got rocks. Pulls out two rocks out of his pocket. So that's... He had them. It was on his person. So, therefore, he was the person that, I guess, got a ticket for having, you know, whatever whatever they said he had. Um, and I got tickets for loitering in a place where they said that drugs were either purchased or sold. But I didn't accept that because that wasn't true. Just because somebody had them on him. What you trying to get me to sign up for, that says something different. And so I ain't supporting that. And now that I think about the story, shout out to Meek Millie. I'm so happy he off, he off, he off the papers now. Yeah, after 12 years. So this, this just reminded me of that. Like, wow, maybe I could have been on papers or something forever if this probably got, a, got um, handled a little bit different. But long story short, so, you know, they give him the ticket. They give me the ticket. You know, you graduate the story, you know, the media finds out, the school finds out, I need to do a press conference. I remember walking to the press conference joking like, oh yeah, here comes Scarface, whatever, whatever, whatever. And uh, I just told the truth. And, you know, that, that's basically what happened. Right. And I guess at the games when you're, you know, getting ready oh, to shoot, the crowd man, would be like, just say dog. no, like the Nancy Reagan thing. And I guess they would chant crack house. They was on They me. were on you. And so it's, it's almost like you get a chance to live in two worlds. Is I get to escape my good, bad, or indifferent things that I need to deal with in my neighborhood to try to, you know, put myself in position to take care of my family and take care of myself. So it's almost like somebody coming to your job to harass you <laughs> about something personal. So initially, we were um, playing against Illinois, and they were like, crack house, crack house. I can't front. At first, I'm like, they, they talking to me? <laughs> like, first, like, how y'all know about this? You know, this is before social media and all that. Second, like, they really clowning me. They, they, and so uh, I was bothered by it. I was I was hurt by it somewhat. But the great thing about sports is I'm still in the game. They go refs. They go the ball. Let's go get it. And so I just started to use it as motivation because when you, no matter what you do for a living, there are gonna always be people that can try to try to look back at something and say, oh, I remember that time when. Because your critics are going to always remind you of what they consider your worst moments are. That's why having a level of character and perseverance allow you to push you through because everybody could get teased about something. So you ended up doing three seasons in Michigan. I did. Should have left after my sophomore year. <laughs> Love Michigan. I remember losing to Carolina, walking off the floor with Coach Fisher, putting my arm around him, saying, we get him next year, Coach. I should have been saying, I'm going to the draft, coach. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get to your NBA career, there was a whole big incident that happened around the team allegedly taking money. Correct. During that time. So Chris Weber gets indicted for taking money from a childhood friend. Are you the only one that didn't get charged? Well, out of the Fab Five? So, I'm glad you asked it that way. And actually, it's reversed. It's, it's, there were four or five people total that got implicated in what's been called the Ed Martin scandal. One of them was on our current team. That was C. Webb. 
The, wow. And the reason why he got that charge, and people keep getting this wrong, it wasn't because of the circumstances. It's because he lied. It's because he lied to the grand jury. Yeah. And by the way, for all of these fools out there, it's not illegal to accept gifts from somebody that you have a prior relationship with while you're in middle school or really? high school. Really? Because Ed Martin is not a booster of the University of Michigan. The one that was giving money to Chris Webb. He's a supporter of young people that are from his neighborhood that went to schools all across the country 20 years before he was doing it for Chris Webber. Huh. Okay, so if someone catches you in high school and says, hey, I'm going to start giving you money in high school, your senior year in high school, they can continue to give you money all through your college career, and that's 100% legal. So here, here's one of the biggest misconceptions about being from the hood. Everybody think it's illegal when you actually know somebody that's not broke. Like, it's okay for me to have a godfather or an uncle, somebody to invest in me that's going to help pay for my ACT classes. It's going to take us to a University of Michigan football game when they play it against Notre Dame. Somebody's going to let us come over his house on Saturdays and clean his cars to make money or shovel the snow or cut the grass. It just looked at from the outside looking in like, they got people to actually help them? They got people to care about that. That's illegal. He knew that you were 6'8 the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that's illegal. He ain't got nothing to do with Michigan. Nothing. And that's why I walked into a courtroom. It's like, yes, he actually gave me a winter coat before. Yes, he actually gave me some boots before. On my birthday one time, Judge, guess what he gave me? A seafood pizza. I didn't know that they existed. <laughs> and I loved them so very much. Okay. Can I go? Well, <laughs> unfortunately, not everyone was able to, to really see the logic of all this. And it actually destroyed the whole legacy of the Fab Five at Michigan, where they actually scrubbed everything from the record books. Mm -hmm. How hurt were you when you heard about that? I was salty. I was disappointed. And, you know, living the story, it didn't take those allegations for that separation to take place. I think that's what gets lost in the story. If you Google when the 10-year separation started versus when we left school, I would say I left school in 94. Mm -hmm. These allegations probably didn't become something um, of an issue until like probably 2000. So there was always this groundswell that this is great while it's lasting, but at some point this is not I guess, who we hope to be moving forward as a program. And business-wise, as I get older, Michigan don't own Fab Five. The NCAA don't own Fab Five. Isaiah Thomas taught me this. Detroit doesn't own bad boys. The NBA or the Pistons don't own the term. So when you operate outside of the norm, Number one, the engine's not going to truly promote what they don't own. Mm. And then number two, based on the fact that while we were successful and continued to help every bottom line at the university, including enrollment, popularity, television revenue, uh, apparel, uh, shoe contracts, like television, like the list goes on and on and on. At on the other hand, they were really brash. They were really outspoken. They were really political. They were actually playing public enemy so loud in the locker room one time, I heard the N-word on the song. Hmm. That mentality, that mentality was important, I think, to have some sort of separation with the university to give it just a chance to breathe. Like we were like a, a, a thunderstorm that came. Like, 
boom, and everything happened so fast. I think everybody just needed a chance to decompress. So that happened during that period. And then when C-Webb had his 10-year separation, it almost became a period of tolerance. It's like, well, you, you, you did go here. You are an alum. You uh, do have a scholarship endowment here. Um, I guess, yeah, yeah. Get you some tickets to the game. <laughs> okay, so then in 1994, you get drafted. Mm -hmm. First round. How did it feel to go through this long journey? And you're, what, 21 years old at the time? I'm a 21 at the draft. 21. You're going through 21 years of living in, you know, the worst, lowest conditions in America. Going to college, still not making any money. And then finally, at the end of all that, you get to actually sign with an NBA team. Well, uh, to you De start to Denver Nuggets, right? Correct. You, you get to play out some of your ghetto fantasies that weren't necessarily <laughs> smart decisions, but they motivated you to go to the gym and work on your game. So I always felt like, yeah, I'm going to get a crib. I'm going to fill a pool up with 40 ounces. <laughs> O.E. I'm definitely doing that. Then it's like, wait a minute. How are you going to put those glass bottles in it? That, that's just a dumb idea. <laughs> you going to just pour it in <laughs> one by one. You'll be there all month. Right. It's just a dumb idea, you know. Um, and so it, 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 it was refreshing to reach my goal and my dream to play in the NBA. But I was also disappointing, disappointed, and I guess somebody would have to be a player to understand this next point that I'm going to make. I was pissed off about where I got picked. So, I, yeah, <laughs> 13, it could have been Alaska. <laughs> I felt like I should have went before then. So to be honest with you, and I love Denver, big shout to Bernie Bickerstaff who gave me my first chance, and people know when I was there, I, you know, I always embrace where I am. I'm mad, though. So once we get past, like, about five or six, I'm like, all right, now. <laughs> I heard some projections that I might go seven. That's why I got this red and white suit on so it can match the Clippers when they pick me with my red gaiters. Don't do this to me now. And then all of a sudden, they don't pick me. I'm like, all right. So by the time I got drafted, I was really upset. So I felt like I had something to prove, more so than I want to go buy everything. It, it was, it's, a, it's a weird dynamic. And the other thing I learned is it's a, it's a big difference between the player that walks across the stage, NFL, NBA in particular, predominantly black sports, which for some strange reasons, I've been saying this for years, oh, oh, that's right, those are the ones with the salary caps too, huh? Mm -hmm. The quasi-dress codes, the, um, the restrictions after high school, where right. fighting is taboo in those sports. Yeah, right. Iverson, you know, contributed to the whole dress code thing. Yeah. You know, everyone suddenly had to wear suits. Yeah. So then everyone was wearing red and blue suits, like, yes. <laughs> looking like pimps yes. on the sidelines. Yes. He, and, he and I <laughs> talked about this because, you know, he – he gave love to how much he appreciated the Fab Five type of thing. And I always love Bubba Chuck as the, the, the first MVP with cornrows. Yep. Put, put, putting on for the culture. And so to, to now be drafted and, and playing in the league, pursuing my goals, pursuing my dreams, I learned a unique dynamic of what it's like to be a player whose family already lives in the suburbs – Versus a player who's trying to move his family to the suburbs. That dynamic is way different. Because you're buying everything for the first time for everybody. Right. You got your mama house, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Everything okay. for everybody. Your you siblings help, need you, cars. You, you're you trying that. to help such and such get a house. You're trying to help such and such get a car. You're trying to help such and such pursue a business interest. You're trying to help <laughs> such and such clean up their name. Trying to help such and such. Have to, so you now, instead of being a part of the family or just a friend or just a homie, that now we can all celebrate and see if, we could chase and pursue this dream together, you also, in a lot of ways, become a leader. 
And you probably could be the youngest in that dynamic too. Yeah. So you end up having all of these people that you're that need you. When when something goes wrong in somebody's life, they feel like you're the person that they're gonna call. Right. That's a lot of responsibility. Right. You had four siblings? Yeah, I'm the youngest of four. Okay, three siblings. Uh-huh. Right. And then your mother. Uncles, aunts. And, and, and by the way, you come from a black family. You got cousins on cousins on cousins. <laughs> okay? You got uncles. You got all of that. And so uh, it, it, it's, a, um, it, it, it's something that you have to learn to navigate really fast. And unfortunately, as you graduate those relationships, usually the people that you've helped put on the, put on the airplane, Eat at the best restaurants, take them to the best shows, giving them gear, putting money in their pocket, um, helping them get cars, helping them get uh, go, go places to live, all of that. The people who ultimately resent you the most are those people. Are those people. Mm -hmm. Yep. Soon as they feel like you're not doing what you used to do for them, they start to assassinate your character. It's It's... It's crazy how that works. I mean, you talked about how you've seen so many NBA players go broke. Mm -hmm. What do you think were the worst financial decisions that you made along the way during your NBA career? I think, too, for players in the past, that and ESPN had a documentary talking about players going broke. Broke. I think I think that phase has ended. Really? I, I, would, I would look into your camera, Vlad, and say, you've seen the last of the elite level top dollar athlete in basketball and football going broke because they're smarter now. And you know what else? They make it more. And lastly, all of the people that were working in the industry probably, that were managing their money, that were representing them, that were advisors to those players, you know what they do? Go on and just represent other people and fly under the radar. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things that I purchased, purchased that I felt like, man, that was a dumb purchase. I was in Toronto one time, and uh, it was a day off. I'm just walking uh, on King Street, and I go up in, I forget the name of the mall. Um, they have this nice mall. I don't like French food, but I'm at a French restaurant. I'm just doing me. I'm a millionaire. I'm Toronto, I'm doing me today. I'm spoiling myself today. I'm buying something. Um, I'm feeling rich today. I'm buying something. All right. Now you, you size 15. You can't really buy no shoes. Can't really buy no 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 tailor made suit. So I'm like, let me electronics. Let me walk over here. Start looking at these phones. I paid fifteen thousand dollars for a Virtu phone. I know what you're talking about. High-end <laughs> cell phones yeah. that, have, that have no real features. They yeah. just look kind of nice. It's like, oh, it's custom crafted by the same people who make Rolls Royce. Right. And you get a concierge and you got all of these plugs that work anywhere in the world and all of this and all of that. I was like, I need that. <laughs> Dumbest purchase. <laughs> Not even close. Well, uh, Michael Jordan to the whole world was considered the greatest of all time. Yes but not in Detroit. Correct. <laughs> so when you got to play... Michael and Jordan, slightly Indiana, too. Okay. Those two places will boo Michael Jordan right. because they love their team so much and bow down to his greatness, obviously. So you got to play him on a number of occasions. Yes. You dunked on him? I dunked while he was in the vicinity. Okay, not on him directly. I didn't physically do him like he went baseline and did Patrick Ewing. <laughs> right. Or nothing like that. And plus, I couldn't jump. But imagine just being a guy growing up in Detroit, and you pointed to something that's really important. The bad boys represented the city. And so I remember, like, seeing people like, you wearing Jordans? To the point where we would clown people for rocking Jordans. And then Uncle Chuck was like, I like Nike, but wait a minute. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm done for show now, for show. And so our bad boys let, let, let Mike and them have it now. Don't sleep. We had our years where we beat Magic Bird and Jordan and won back-to-back -back championships. So 
being on the floor with the GOAT, especially his final year, playing against them in the Game 7 at the United Center. We up double digits in the second quarter. Oh, we had him. And then all of a sudden he turned into the Black Cat and Scottie Pippen started stealing the ball from us and Dennis Robbins started grabbing every rebound. Like, that's the greatest team of all time. Hands down. Hands down. Yeah. And it's not necessarily about who starts the game in the NBA, if you watch. It's who finishes the game. Okay. And in the era of positionless basketball, they had Tony Kukoc, the waiter, who was 6'10", dribble pass and shoot, make threes, a Hall of Famer. No, I think Tony Kukoc is, he, yeah, he in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Dennis Rodman, the greatest defender and, and rebounder that's not a center ever. Scottie Pippen, one of the top 50 players of all time, one of the greatest defenders of all time. And they got the GOAT, Michael Jordan. And I got to throw a name out here that people keep sleeping on. Y'all folks better Google Ron Harper, please. I, 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 I don't understand why he – before Harp got hurt, he played with the Cavs. He hurt his knee. He was about to be on track to be in the Jordan conversation. They had him playing with them. And so, uh, yeah, with Phil on the sideline, that squad right there. Right, because John Sally told me that, you know, and he's played, you know, with Jordan and Pippen. He said that Pippen's actually a better player than Jordan. See, the, the funny thing is, I think Scotty is more skilled than all of them. Scotty Pippen is probably the most skilled player I've ever played with. Really? Yeah. And his hands come to his shit. <laughs> okay? Standing straight up. We got a drug test, John. <laughs> And that's my big brother. He smokes a lot of weed. I so know he, he does. He I know that, he, he does. Failed that drug I, I remember when John came to the city and he bought the big mansion. I got a chance to go over there and everything. That's my big brother in the game. He helped put me on at the best damn sports show in Fox. I got a chance to work with him for years. He vegan now. And so I understand where he's coming from. He's a very knowledgeable individual with the game. But you know what that is? I'm going to tell you what that is. I know what that is. What is it? Deep down in his heart, you ask him, what team do you identify with the most in your career, Sal? And he's going to be like, the bad boys. So it's only right for him to feel like that about MJ. He can't help it. He can't help it. Well, he said that he's the most skilled player he's ever played. MJ is? Played with. No, it Pippen. Yeah, I'm looking at this clip right now. John Sally said, Pippen, not Jordan, is the most skilled player I've ever played with. Sal needs to be drug tested. Sal, in his heart of hearts, can't believe that. And I'm going to tell you why. And again, that's my big brother. As a youngster in Detroit, when he was on the team, like, come on. Him, Isaiah, Vinny, Joe, like, we got you. Mahorn, I'm little bro to them. Same thing in the media. He brought me on. I'm little bro. But he tripping. And it's because he's a member of the bad boys. And he elbowed Scottie Pippen. And he got a migraine. And we won the series. <laughs> he elbowed Michael Jordan. And ended up going to win championships with him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you were trash talking Jordan, what were exactly what he's telling you? Do you remember? He's overrated. Um, he told Jordan he's overrated. <laughs> How did he react? Wow, I did watch those words come out of my mouth, huh? <laughs> You're overrated. <laughs> I, because part of me, part of my ego makes me think I was a member of the Bad Boys team, but I actually didn't get a uniform. So it's like when they walked off and didn't shake the Bulls' hands, when I look back at that footage, I was on the team. I felt that. That was everything to me. So I rooted against Jordan his whole career, his entire career, hoping that I made it to the NBA. And now I'm in the league, and there he go. And it's the play. Get up. Take this. That's the beautiful thing about basketball. There's times I went to bed at night and probably played in a game where I scored more points than Michael Jordan. <laughs> That's the, that's, that's the beauty of sports. Little, little bumpy face, skinny kid from Detroit. But, uh, he, but, but I did not clearly get the better. 
He did elbow me in the head one time. I vividly remember at Market Square Arena. I'm going up for a rebound. He ran the back of the head. I'm, I know you saw that. You you was looking right. Oh, did he get called? No. no. <laughs> I'm like, I know you saw that. You you standing right here. But, uh, yeah, the GOAT, no question about it. And, 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 and I have to say this because you brought up Sal's quotes, and I know we have current NBA fans who – Love LeBron, and he deserves to be in one of the greatest, you know, Mount Rushmore players. Michael Jordan ain't the best. No, sorry, I lied. He's number one, two, three, four, and five, like KRS one. Don't get it twisted. Okay, two separate three peats. Come on now, two separate three peats. And he won finals MVP every time? Right. That, that I, I could give you all kind of stats, like him averaging 36. And, you know, I could give you first team all defense. and all. And I could give you all of that. But what I just said will never be duplicated. And the man played basketball with his tongue out. <laughs> like, think about, I can't talk with my tongue out, let alone dribbling and playing basketball. I forgot about that part. <laughs> well, you actually played him again when he came back to the Wizards. Oh, yeah. And at that point, it was a whole different game. Clark Kent. <laughs> you know, Clark yeah, Kent. yeah, Clark Kent. You at least got a chance. <laughs> you know, when he's Superman and Black Cat, you ain't have a chance. But now as a member of the Wizards, I, I can at least get a little, oh, yeah. And I, I get a little something off. But later in his career, as we now live in an era where players can – play a lot longer because the game isn't as physical. The advancements of medicine have truly helped. And the low management thing is something that now rest and healthy players is in vogue. Michael Jordan was 40 years old, playing for the Wizards, played 82 games. Yeah, man. Michael Jordan still, <laughs> still considered the GOAT by most people. Then there's Kobe. Okay. You said that you tried – to actually uh, hurt Kobe at one point, which actually ended up messing up his, his foot. His ankle. His ankle, and you took him out for one game. Yes. How do you feel about that now as a 46-year-old man? Correct. So um, first off, uh, th there's a lot of layers to this. I love and respect Kobe Bryant. I just actually got finished talking about him re just now on Get Up. That's my guy. Now that's my guy. To the point where he admitted something to me that I didn't know. He was like, who do you think my player, favorite player was when I was growing up? Like, Jordan. I named like 50 people. Why? Kobe did an interview and said that I was his favorite player growing up. Really? I Googled it. Wow. Okay. It was in USA Today. Okay. I was like, all right. This is why you should never meet your idols. That's why he <laughs> scored 81 points and I was on the other team. But... That ended up being payback to me for what you're asking me now. And so playing against a guy like Kobe, virtually unstoppable. He had a series of games where he scored like 40 straight. He had 50 straight. He had 60 against the Mavs in three quarters. And they went to the finals that year. Yeah, Like we was in the lottery. We were a bad defensive team anyway. But playing against him in the finals again, I'm thinking this is before any questions were being asked. So, like, now you look back at hindsight, and I don't think it's cute. I don't think it's cool. I don't think I'm hard because I tried to hurt Kobe Bryant in a, in a game. I'm disgusted by it because, you know, I wanted to win that bad that I was willing to basically cheat to do it. So that's – how I really feel about it. Now, the actual circumstance in doing it for anybody that's ever played ball, he go up for the shot, act like you're contesting, let him land on your foot. Modern day, you saw Zaza Pachulia do this to Kawhi Leonard, a um, couple other cases or whatever. After the game in 2000, I wasn't asked about it. 
the 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 Lakers didn't feel like oh when I drove to the basket they was gonna give me a hard foul to retaliate it because it seemed like it was on the up and up. I admitted it once I retired after he scored eighty one against the Raptors because I felt like that was validation. Right, because there was that a uh, commercial that came <laughs> out when you know you're meeting Kobe for for dinner. And he's ordering a martini. They're like, how many olives would you like, Mr. Bryant? He said, 81. <laughs> <laughs> you guys just stared at each other. <laughs> no doubt. And, and he he's one of the greatest to ever do it. Yeah. And for, for anybody that can appreciate, like, those that are elite at what they do, sometimes you just get on the wrong side of history when such and such is um, in, a, in a rap battle and then all of a sudden you look up and they win diamond. It's like, oh, well, okay, maybe I should. Whoa. Or you play against Tom Brady and he's going to throw six or seven touchdowns in the game or, or whatever. Like, whatever industry that you're in, if you are in it for long enough and you get a chance to go against the best of the best, when I was in the league, I'm going to tell you who won the championships. Hakeem Olajuwon won the first two. Then Michael Jordan won the next three. I'm five years in. Those guys won the championships. Tim Duncan come grab a couple. Shaq and Kobe grab three in a row. And before you know it, I'm out the league. All-time greatness. Got a chance to witness it. And so when these guys get going the way he was going on that night, I always just want young people to realize something. If he would have talked trash, if he would have thumped his chest, if he would have had any type of ego or bravado, we would have hard filed him, tried to hurt him, and he wouldn't have got past 50. Mm. And there's no highlights. That game, he has no highlights. It was straight smack down, grown man, making every shot, balling like he can. And so, hey, man, I was there. Well, you said that the, the most hostile and angry trash talker ever Gary Payton. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He comes from Oakland, where, where I'm from as well. And so we're cousins. You know how this works, Detroit in the Bay Area type of thing. Going to KMEL Summer Jams in the early 90s, standing on stage with Hammer. My guy, Too Sure. What up, though, Mark Curry? Those are my peoples. Um, GP is like, is, 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 is like an older brother to me. So there was a time at, at Michigan even getting a chance to play in the Pacific Northwest, getting a chance to meet him and going to one of their games when I was in college. I always idolized the fact that he was a big guard. He's on the cover of Sports Illustrated when I was young, about trash talking. I wanted to model myself after that. And so on the floor, of course, he's going to have a level of confidence and and, and now that I've seen the commercial with Mr. Mean and I got a little bit older, got a chance to meet him and understand where Gary's from, I understand why he had that level of toughness. But also, a lot of the things that he said would be usually things that you only heard in the alley or in street ball. <laughs> what, was, like, the worst thing you, what was the worst thing Gary Payton said to you in the game? Well, the, the crazy thing is we got along. And so we were playing against them in Europe. I had just got to Indy. This was like 1996. I got traded there in the offseason. And just so happened we were on a European tour and played against Seattle two straight games. And all I know is this. This dude out there cussing at me like he ain't never seen me before in life. Like I would just win him. Like I would just win him, Vlad, like 10 hours ago. Having drinks. <laughs> this dude, like, you mother... Like, I'm like, okay. It's a strategy. I'm like, got it. He's trying to get you got off. Got it. Trying to get you off your game. Got it. And he's a player also... Think about it. So he's a, he's a future Hall of Famer. The strength of his game is defense and toughness. He talks a lot of trash, and he's willing to fight you. <laughs> right? Right. What you going to do with that? What are you going to do? <laughs> well, when you were with the, with the Pacers, you went to the Eastern Conference Finals three times in a row. You went to the Finals one of those years. Mm -hmm. But no rings. 
No ring. After you retired after 13 seasons, you walked away with no rings. Does that bother you? Yeah. I wanted a championship. And the reason why is because I got so close. Yeah, you were at the finals. Correct. And so fortunately for me, every level that I played basketball, I got a chance to play against the best, play with the best, and on the top level, the biggest stages. I don't care if this was AAU growing up, high school, college, pros. And so to be there, but man, they got Shaq, they got Kobe, they're really good. We weren't the favorite. And so it wasn't like we got upset. Um, but yeah, you, you play to try to achieve the ultimate goal of winning a championship. And for me, it's not even about the ring. What I wanted to participate, I wanted to participate in a parade. Mm. Yeah. That's what I wanted that eluded my career in uh, college and the pros. Well, usually people finish their NBA career or their football career or whatever, and then they get into commentating. But you actually started doing it while you were still in the NBA, which is fairly rare. Were you the first one to really do that? So there were a couple of people that planted seeds that I was like, I could try to follow in those footsteps. Initially, you saw the all-time great players still doing some media. So when I was young, Bill Russell was doing some stuff. Magic was doing stuff. Isaiah was doing media. And so being a Michigander, Magic Johnson, childhood idol. Isaiah Thomas, Detroiter, looked up to him. Really, I just kind of followed what they did. Hmm. You know, if you, if you notice, both of those guys are beyond their killer instincts on the floor and forget their basketball prowess and skill. I'm talking about if you look at them as individuals off the floor, both of those guys, well-spoken, entrepreneurs, good smiles, make everybody feel welcome. But also, if you get on their wrong side, they offer you forever. <laughs> to the point where, as somebody that saw them basically have that kind of relationship with each other, I'm happy that they're back seeing eye to eye. And uh, the, the, the opportunity to work in the media was something I didn't take for granted because it was my major in college. Mass communications, radio, TV, film. Usually people in our country, for whatever reason, you major in something, you end up working in something else. Fortunately for me, I get the chance to work in the field I played in. Covering, playing in the 2000 finals against the Lakers and then covering them when they were playing against the Nets a couple of years ago because three, four months before that, I got traded from Indiana to the Bulls in February, and they had nine or 10 wins. So I'm like, oh, we ain't going to the playoffs. I reached out to my contact at BET Mad Sports because I was on there a couple of times. You know, that's when they still had the mayor at the time. <laughs> and boom, yo, all y'all got to do is sit in the camera. I got a spot in LA. I'll get us access. They trusted me. They did it. They believed in it. We cut it and spiced it. They played it on TV. I took that same idea and pitched it to the best damn sports show the next year. Chris Rose, John Sally, my big brother. They liked it. They hired me. So from 2003, 2004 to 2007, I'm playing in the league, scoring 20 points a game, but yet still working for best damn sports show, MTV Movie Awards, um, NFL Network when they started, Cold Pizza before it became First Take, TNT, Studio, and Sideline. Um, there's footage of Nick Van Exel, my brother, messing with me, throwing the towel on me while I was doing Sideline. So I was doing all of this while I was still playing. So once I retired, I started my little YouTube page. I remember, that was so funny. Um, started my, what was that, uh, MySpace? That was so funny. But then in 2007, when I realized that I wasn't going to play anymore, started working full-time with ESPN. Did it bother you when you finally had to retire? No. 
It didn't bother me when I, because I always, so they're, they're, I like to gauge success off of realistic expectations. And each day, the rest of the world saw me as Jalen Rose. I saw myself as the next magic. So when I'm in high school and our center, Elton Carter, gets injured in the Final Four, and I'm jumping center in the state championship game, that's me embodying my magic in 1979. When I go to Michigan, I'm fifth member of the Five Five to sign. I know, but three plus two is five. It's Magic's number. You know, like everything always boiled back to being him. And so I realized that that actually kept me humble because to the rest of the world, hey, you're Jalen Rose. To me, you ain't no Magic as you start to get older. You definitely ain't no Magic. And so retiring from the game, I was like, I exceeded – you know, my realistic expectations other than the fact that I wanted to win a championship and wasn't able to get it done. So you end up joining ESPN. Mm -hmm. You and Skip Bayless had an interesting back and forth. We did. How long ago was that? I want to say that took place in 2010 or 11. Yeah. I think so, because it was actually taken off the air and someone reposted it on, on YouTube. And yeah. I, I went through it. Yeah. And you guys really went at it. Mm hmm What do you think was the gist of that argument? The gist of the argument I had with Skip Bayless, by the way, we had multiple deba debates. Yeah, but that one kind of stood out. Correct. So, as I mentioned, I was on the show since it was in New York and it was cold pizza. I used to be a guest on the show to when it graduated and became first take and moved to Bristol. And so now we see it doing the work that it's doing right now uh, with Stephen A, Max, and uh, my lovely wife, Molly. And so the content of the debate was I was defending the idea that it's okay to name call as your analysis of describing players. Because there was a period of time where he was coming up with nicknames. Chris was Bosch Spice. And it was, a, it was a couple of more that I don't remember off the top of my mind. So basically, you know, I, I was coming from the standpoint of I was encouraged to get into this industry for a lot of different reasons. One of them is I wanted to try to be what I personally consider a voice of reason that can have an opinion, a strong one, that can, can, can definitely, you know, ruffle some feathers, but not make it personal, <laughs> which to me is, is, is something totally different. You learn that trash talking, um, playing outside growing up. It's one thing for you to be future NBA player talking trash to local drug dealer. It's another thing to know that he can go pop the trunk on you and end the game, and you never make it to the league. So you learn eventually what to say and what not to say, and more importantly, what not to say to certain people. But a lot of times that could get blurred. And when you're giving your description of what you feel like they are as a player – or what you felt like their behavior was, my point was there's a way to do that without calling the person by a, ni a, a niche nickname that's clearly not positive. What Wasn't part of the argument about you being an ex-player and him never playing the game? That's where it ended up going. Yeah. Because initially it was about, uh, it was about Russell Westbrook. It was about the fact that Russell Westbrook wasn't a traditional point guard. Oh, he's only gone on an average of triple-double for three straight years. <laughs> right. Something I never thought that somebody would be able to do. And definitely as a tall point guard that grew up idolizing, you know, so many people, I always wonder who that guy would be. And what we were talking about, I think the, the, the debate, I think what the debate topic was, is he a true point guard? And what I was trying to explain is that 
positionless basketball is where the game is going. So now you hear that term and you hear a lot of people using it. I was talking about this almost 10 years ago. And I was describing him as a player. I was like, he's not a traditional point guard. And I think as much as he loved the San Antonio Spurs, I think I was trying to tell him, when Tony Parker's at his best, it's 25 points and five assists. It's not 20 points and 12 assists. And I was trying to explain to him the kind of combination guard Russell Westbrook was, and then his retort was a personal one because he said, so what kind of guard were you? So now, somebody that grew up in the hip hop era, and that's more than just rapping with a microphone, as Kara's taught us, it's graffiti, it's break dancing, it's DJing, it's a lifestyle, it's what you say, it's what you wear. If I'm gonna go on a debate show, I kinda gotta have a couple of counterpoints to make if somebody throw shade. And so I had done some research that I had been sitting on that I didn't know that I was going to actually even say it that day. Probably could have said it two, three months prior because I had it for, <laughs> I just never resorted to mentioning it. And so uh, once I saw that the debate created, a, uh, had a tipping point and became personal. Became personal, right. That's when I wanted to acknowledge that, okay, I heard you say you was a certain type of player, but then this is what it actually ended up being. So it really was in the context, it was really in the context of sports. You know, it wasn't like I was trying to sit in the backseat of a car, like, ah, ah, aha, gotcha moment. It's, I'm a player from for 20 years, people can Google how much I averaged, and it becomes free game, right? So I felt the exact same way. Right, but he never played pro sports. No. Did he play in college? Not that I know of. So he was a high school player? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it is and, what it is. <laughs> right, and, and so, uh, and again, it's a debate though. So you're going back and forth, and, and frankly, when I saw his reaction to it, I felt bad about it. So I did apologize to him. I gave him some designer shoes <laughs> as well. And when we see each other, we cool. He's, he's killing it with Shannon Sharp right now. I follow their movement. And you know, it's water under the bridge. It's just, it's just a moment that happens in, in debate. Well, you went on to just have a bunch of huge shows. You were doing what, like three shows at the same time? Yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> Grinding. Grinding. Right now, um, I'm really fortunate. So the, the, the opportunities that I now have at ESPN and in media, I'm really grateful for. And for people that want to work in this industry, you have to work really hard for. And the trick that I play on you guys is that I'm not working hard. That's just game. That means I'm outworking everybody. 24-7, 365, I'm consumed by it. I'm watching sports, I'm watching entertainment, I'm paying attention to fashion, I'm paying attention to politics. It's ESPN right here, it's CNN right here, it's MSNBC, it's Fox, it's Entertainment Tonight, it's Ellen DeGeneres, it's Hard Knocks, it's Showtime, Wu-Tang. I'm watching everything. Right. All of the time. And Vlad TV. And Vlad TV, of course. Right. I even hit you up and let you know I was sitting <laughs> and watching. And so... You have to be consumed by this, in my opinion, to be competitive at it. And so now, initially working at the company, I got a chance to work on so many shows. NBA Tonight, Coast to Coast, Monday through Friday with Numbers Never Lie. And at that moment, I realized I had a, I had a, a, a John Sally-ish revelation. I was like... I'm the only former basketball player that's doing a Monday through Friday national televised sports show. And now, in 2019, some of my favorite people who just happen to be football players, Mike Golick, Marcellus Wiley, Michael Strahan, Chris Carter, Shannon Sharp, 
Nate Burleson, all Monday through Friday shows. Mm -hmm. You know what drum I'm still quietly trying to beat down? To not be the only basketball player doing it Monday through Friday. At one point, you married one of your coworkers. I did. And uh, when did this happen, first of all? Uh, I'm a, it was, so we like, uh, was it 15, 16 months in now? Okay. I'm surprised she even knew my name. <laughs> I woke up this morning like, you married me? What were you thinking? <laughs> well, and then there was an interview with LeVar Ball when he made mm. a comment about her. Which got him banned uh, from ESPN. When you first saw that that footage, what did you think as her husband? I was watching it live. Oh, you were watching it live? Okay. Yes, I was. The first thing I thought was, I got his number in my phone. I live with her. I don't want this to create a stain. And we all know how this social media generation works. It may trend and become... Um, it, it may trend or it may not. So in my head, I'm trying to, I'm going to see which way the wind blow. You know, she felt some type of way about what he said. He felt some type of way about his reaction. How did she feel? When she got home that night, what did she tell you in terms of her feelings? So it, 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 it's unique because this isn't just my friend. This isn't somebody I'm dating. This is somebody I just live with. This is my this is my actual wife. Yeah. So, for anybody that's ever been married, <laughs> you don't run your household anyway. <laughs> if you tell your boys you do, you're lying. So number one, we decompress directly, indirectly about what happened at work. So we kind of have like a routine about it. We work together. So it ain't like we driving into work, hey, what do you think about Monday Night Football last night? And then driving home, like, yeah, you see LeBron's post about Taco Tuesday? Like, we're not doing that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's later in the day at some point, we kind of decompress about who, what, when, and where. So ours had already gone by before we really talked about it because that's our routine. But he had already said something about it because I think somebody interviewed him about it or whatever. So now it's the circumstance, what happened, how they responded, and then his, his inter then also he compounds it with an interview. What did he say in his interview afterwards? He was like, uh, you know, I think her hair was in the gutter or, you know, whatever, whatever. So she took it the wrong way is how he how Yeah, he like she took it the wrong way. And, and by the way, you're talking to somebody that has had so many different flare-ups and brushes throughout his life. So I ain't coming to nobody, especially my wife, trying to act like I ain't never had my name in the headline for the wrong reason or got into it with somebody in the media, mm -hmm. you know? So I judged how she felt by how she responded to my text. So I text her, I was like, everything good? Was How you feeling? And I text him too. Did he respond? When I got, when the show ended, we both played, he tried to, we played phone tag. I tried him, he tried me. Right after their show, I was doing, I, like you said, I do a couple of shows, so he hit me while I was doing Jalen and Jacoby. Then boom, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna try to hit him back. He didn't leave a message, you know, call me. Boom, and I couldn't get him on the phone. So at this point, he had already did a second interview about it. But the bottom line is this, I wanna squash something, and not you. You fools think Jalen and Molly Karen Rose got what it take to get somebody banned from Disney, ABC, and ESPN? Y'all really believe that? I just saw a promotion with him and Stephen A. Smith about who had the best debate on their show a week ago. So this idea that, oh, she got a black man banned from the network. Like, that's just ignorant. So he's not banned? No, he not banned. I just saw his face on TV a week ago. Well, so where did the news come from who, that he was banned? I, you don't know. And people, you know, working in the media, people take headlines. Like, where did that term even come from? There has not been a supporter in the national media 
that represented for the Ball family father in particular than me. I mean, I'm looking. I asked for him to adopt me. <laughs> I mean, I'm looking at the Business Insider. It says LeVar Ball reportedly no longer welcome at ESPN after latest controversial appearance. Reportedly no longer welcome. Right. Okay. Until and, and, and two and weeks was, later. <laughs> he, he's back again. Well, was, was, okay, so let me ask you a question. Was she personally bothered by that comment, or did she think it's just part of the job? She didn't She didn't get us. I mean, it's, it was a live TV moment. They had their interaction, and we keep it moving. It was, she didn't get in the car mad, or she didn't get in the car and cry, or we didn't talk about him all the way home. <laughs> it wasn't a big deal. We're rich. <laughs> we work on television. We talk about sports. Yeah, how mad are you going to be? Right. <laughs> this is the worst that comes with right, all that. Yeah. <laughs> they had an awkward exchange on TV. Like, when the last time you tried to get somebody dap and it was awkward, or a hug and it was awkward. Like, okay. you know, just like all day, like, I can't believe it ate this morning when I tried to get a dap at work. Oh, man, that one didn't go so well. Like, whatever. Well, you're managed by Rock Nation. Absolutely. How do you feel about the whole Jay-Z thing and the whole kneeling, we're past that? So I, I, I want to educate young people on something. Uh, I want to do another Chuck D reference because I just saw recently he was posting about the fact that he stopped using the N-word, right? Chuck D. Chuck D. Who rarely use it anyways. Who rarely use it anyways. It's a, Lyricist, and for those who have been paying attention to the industry, has bars. Yeah. Okay. The, the only time I heard him in the hands of a pull the trigger. Yeah. What, what, what song was that? Uh, uh, come on down. Welcome to the Terror Dome. Welcome to the Terror Dome. So, there we go. So, so just that, think, that's the only time I've heard him say that. Just think about what we just did. Just think about what we just did. You said a half of a melody to a song that came out. 30 years ago. Right, and you knew exactly what it was. Knew the record. Yep. One of my hobbies is DJ. But also, that's the difference between how the game is now. I remember going to the record store on Tuesday. Can't wait till Tuesday. Right. Uh, that's, when, that's when the albums came out. Go buy the record, go read the credits, mm -hmm. go listen to it all, consume. That, that's when musicians were being groomed to be artists. Mm -hmm. And so... When him saying he stopped using the N-word, I responded because that's one of my idols. Chuck D is like listening to his listen to like listen to his music back in the day is like just so dope. And still to this day, still selling out shows across the world. Yeah. I noticed when I responded, I had some people hitting me back trying to question our motives. I'm like, hmm. So first off, I can say and not say what I want. That's my opinion. <laughs> That's one. Two, I understand the power in words and how your tongue is a sword. And he used the term that I love, that in vocabulary, it represents an STD slavery transmitted disease because now we just want to hold on to the word so much it takes so much pride and yeah i used it can nobody tell me i can't use it and that's fine but if you've ever been to a concert and a lot of these artists is going platinum double platinum and triple platinum there are a lot of different people buying their music mm -hmm. singing along and they're singing along and words and all and words and all yep and I don't blame them. They're enjoying the music. That's entertainment. I can separate Arnold Schwarzenegger from the Terminator. Mm -hmm. I can separate the two. So in this context, I was like, I stopped using it 16 years ago. It don't, it don't make me better than anybody else. It don't make me tough or cool or hard. So, so why did you do it? One, I wanted to expand my vocabulary because I wanted to work in this industry. And I curse like a sailor at different points of my life. And doing so much live TV as I do now, that ain't working towards my goal. Two, I remember being in the league in the suburbs at the mall 
with my homeboys and we're the minority. But we're yelling it across the mall. Yo, ma! Yo! I'm like, just looking at the reaction of like the other people around, black, white, whoever. It was kind of like an uneasiness of like whatever. And then I decided if I don't want somebody saying it to me and I don't want somebody singing along with it in a rap lyric, maybe I personally can and should stop saying it. So I did. That's all. And I brought up that analogy as you asked me about Jay-Z in the NFL for the same reason. Number one, I always take into account who's making the moves and or who's speaking. First off, I'm about to disqualify 95% of people talking about this topic that don't get back to their community. Yeah, Jay-Z actually, because someone asked him about it, and he broke down, and he goes, you have 365 days in the year. I could tell you during those last 365 days how many people I've kept out of jail, how many mm. people I help feed, how many people I help with lawyers. You know, can you do that? You know, Correct. The, the Twitter chatter is cool. We get it. But how many people have you actually, you know, had actions that actually helped? Correct. So a couple, so a couple, of, so a couple of things. One... I always take into account who's speaking and or who's doing the action because that allows me to get a track record on their true intention based on what they've already done. That may seem simple, but that's like a life skill that I make sure that I apply. Mm -hmm. And when you look back at what he's been able to accomplish as a man, as an entrepreneur, as an artist, as somebody that's been a, a, a social activist, I trust that track record. And is another side of the street that I got to expose young people to. I remember a time when I was young. Both of these gentlemen, rest, God rest their soul, were not here anymore. I remember hearing whose method was better or worse. MLK or Malcolm X. I, I, I remember these debates. Like, like, you might remember Prince and Michael Jackson debates. Like, it's, it's the same thing. Yeah, I mean, nonviolent versus violent. Correct. Or, or, or just, or just the, 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 the approach. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just, just the approach. And so what I'm getting at is there has to be multiple... There has to be multiple sacrifices, not just one. And I was one of the, and still am, a, a, an avid supporter of Colin Kaepernick. I think as long as you're remembered by what you did away from the field more than you did, more than what you did on the field, that's a win. There's a score of the game and a game of life. And when I start thinking back, back, when I start to think back at all of the athletes that were socially and politically conscious that made a stand, I'm like Bill Russell, Jim Brown, Muhammad Ali, um, um, Tommy Smith, John Carlos. Like you go on and on and on. He gets named. Kaepernick. Yeah. Colin Kaepernick will get named. So now. What did that cost him? His career. So you feel he got blackballed? Absolutely. Not, not feel. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, he absolutely did. He's not in, him not being in the NFL has nothing to do with the fact that he isn't one of the best 80 quarterbacks walking the face of the earth. Marcellus Wiley said some things about mm -hmm. Kaepernick recently. You saw that? Yeah. Well, Marcellus, actually, that's my guy. I got love for him. Yeah, well, I actually had him on my show. And we talked about that whole yeah, situation. That's my guy. You know, what he talked about, which he expanded on, on Vlad TV, was that. Yeah, one, um, saying someone is mixed race is matter of fact. Um, if you take it as a negative connotation or a positive connotation, that's on you. But mixed race is a matter of fact. So I said his bio, 
And it's amazing, if you read me my bio, I'm not disturbed. I don't have a negative connotation. I'm not outraged by reading my bio in any capacity because it's who I am. I just told everybody who he was and everybody went that way, which told me about what they were thinking, one. However, a mixed race guy who is raised by two white parents from Wisconsin to Central California where he lived, I think it was Trulock, um, is in this situation where I said, I'm not disqualifying him for leading this cause. I also said, it's not about race. I'm not talking about his black card, which I don't even think exists. I hate when people say you're black card. I'm not pulling his black card, he's black. I never even talked about his, him being black or not. He's black. I also didn't talk about his complexion, which a lot of people are talking about, mixed race, light skin. Y'all don't know any dark mixed race people? I do, so I don't know where that came from as well. I said this all because people are blind to what the conditions are in their world. There is a war going on, and they have combined forces, and they coexist only in one place. And the war is race and class. How would you react to that? Marcellus is my brother, and I'll text him when I leave here, because the great thing about having friends that you, I guess we're not a monolithic, we, we can disagree. And that's my stand here. Being biracial to me does not exclude you from having an opinion about racial injustices. Right, but, but not, not so much that you're just biracial, but the fact that he did not grow up in, in, in a situation where the police are, you know, basically, you know, uh, martial law in your neighborhood where you are being, you know, arrested all the time and so forth. I, I don't, I, I just think we have to be careful of feeling like because I'm from Detroit, because he's from Compton, that gives us more of a black card to talk about issues that affect all of us across the country. Yeah. So I, I would disagree with that element of it because you could ch take a, a, a tub of vanilla ice cream, put a couple of drops of chocolate in there, guess what it becomes? Chocolate ice cream. Correct. Especially in America. Correct. <laughs> and so, um, for me, it's about intention. Right. And when Colin took a knee, his intention was to do a peaceful protest and to bring, in, uh, to br bring to light injustices that are still happening, that have not gotten better. And at that point, he showed, he's proven, that he was willing to risk his career by doing so. And he did. What about the Nessa part? You know, you said earlier that as Kaepernick started to gain more and more momentum, he started to speak less right. himself. He, he was not doing, you know, verbal interviews. He was doing some print stuff here and there. He would tweet and, you know, post here and there. But he was not speaking. And Nessa, his girlfriend, began to speak for him. Mm -hmm. And you made a point in that interview that Nessa is speaking for Colin Kaepernick, but she herself is not black. Right. Uh, she's Egyptian, I believe. Yeah. Which some people could classify as black, depending on the lens that you're looking at. But she is not an African-American black person, as you are or Kaepernick is and so forth. And you had an issue with that. So can you explain why? Yeah, um, I had an issue with it. I mean, look. Like you said, you can look deeper into the Egyptian culture and what they're dealing with. Um, I would dare anyone to ask a Nubian or a Sudanese about an Egyptian existence when they're being gunned down and people of color are being gunned down out there, um, having issues with the police. But I also, you know, would, would, would question why do Egyptians say, hey, I'm going to Africa when they're talking about going within the same continent, it's pretty interesting. You got to do your own research on Egypt to understand this uh, versus sub-Saharan Africa, which is the lead way and the, the breeding ground for black America out here, um, or Middle Eastern culture, uh, living in Saudi Arabia like she did, whatever. I'm not going to get bogged down in those details. I will say that what she's done has gotten real comfortable with the cause, um, which is fine because of her intimate uh, experience with her, her boyfriend and Colin Kaepernick. 
But there, there's issue that I take that becomes an appropriation situation because she's calling other brothers out outside their names. Uh, Ray Lewis, that's suggesting that he's a coon. Now, I don't know where y'all from, but if someone non-black is talking about someone black in that respect, that's a, that's a violation and that's a felony. That ain't misdemeanor. That's like, where are you coming from? You, you have a white wife. Right. If she started disparaging other black men and calling them derogatory terms. Well, I don't know exactly. I have to see what she said before I comment, comment on her. Let's pull it up. Because I've, just so you know, I met Nessa before. Um, and I said to her what I'm saying to you, that it was really noble. I felt it was noble what Colin did, and I support him. And here's my math. If he ever wants to reach out in any way, shape, or form, I'm here. So apparently, Kaepernick was being considered by the Baltimore Ravens. Mm -hmm. And then... Yeah, so there there was a picture that she posted of uh, uh, Biscotti. Mm -hmm. Am I pronouncing this right? Oh, uh, 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 Steve Bushotti. Bushotti, sorry. So she posted a picture. She she tweeted a picture of Bushotti hugging Ray Lewis, you know, with a Django Unchained. Oh, got it. <laughs> you know, no, uh, uh, Samuel Jackson. Samuel Jackson okay. with Leonardo DiCaprio. Gotcha, basically. gotcha, gotcha. Inferring gotcha, gotcha. that Lewis is. Gotcha. Gotcha. You know Samuel Jackson's character. Oh, that, that, that's and then it. that meeting was can't afterwards. That right. whole that whole job prospect was. So over. I got a, I got an easy answer for that one. Okay. For somebody who's who's married, as we already talked about, what that sounds like to me is she probably had to ask him, or they probably needed to consult with one another before that got posted. Right. Based on the fact that was going to affect his possible job prospect. So it sounds like that she wasn't acting independently per se. Maybe, maybe not. So th th I don't that know that's, that's, that's how, because if they were going to offer him something and then they didn't, she felt like they didn't get what they offered. And as you mentioned, based on her background, I would, I would, I would assume that that was something that it probably went on her page in my opinion, but it sounds like a couple post. Possibly. <laughs> Did you see the, the exchange between uh, Jay Z and Roger Goodell at that? Uh, I did. You know what I'm talking about when the, they gave Dap and was laughing. You, you seen that before? It was a Miss Dap, right? Kind of like no, it wasn't two, a Miss uh, Dap. Uh, he, two, he, two different intentions. He, he, I mean, he kind of grabbed Jay Z by the, kind of patted him on yeah, the like, arm, like, and Jay Z had somewhat of a violent, almost yeah, a violent like, reaction. Yeah. Like, hey, hey, get, yeah. get off me. I've teased several times with all this great entertainment. I hope people don't forget that a great football game is going to break out in the middle of it, by the way. I hope, I hope they do. <laughs> we partners, dog. I don't work for you. That's all that was. It's a like, very, very like, uncomfortable no, moment. That, it did look that, uncomfortable that, to you? That, but, but, but it looked uncomfortable to me. That's why. You can see Ty Ty in the background kind of correct. <laughs> getting ready right. like you about to so, <laughs> so jump in. Again, for yeah. me, it's not that somebody's partnering with the NFL on behalf of the causes that were suggested that need that support. For me, it's who. And if I had to name people that I felt like are best positioned to sit at the table, understand what's at stake for all sides, and be a, a game-changing agent, give me the guy that when a commissioner try to grab my arm like we homies, it's like, nah, dog. We ain't there. Because if that's him and Ty having that commercial, I mean, if that's him and Ty having that conversation, he'll move his arm like that. Mm. No, nah, dog. Uh-uh. This ink ain't even dried yet. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. I'm right now understanding that there's going to be X amount of people that assassinate my character for sitting here with you right now. Right, which is why he had a press conference <laughs> already well and then there was the whole thing with jay-z was supposed to buy an nfl team and that from what i understand came from his camp like this wasn't just thrown out of nowhere right and then shortly afterwards it was announced that that's actually not true do you know any any of the story behind that i don't all i know is usually that industry that business of ownership 
Yeah. As we talk about why Colin kneeled and or why Tommy Smith and John Carlos raised their fists at the Olympics or why Muhammad Ali refused to serve his country when called upon and went to prison, and went for, to it. prison for it, mm -hmm. I feel like I've been having these same conversations for 40 years. You know why? Because we still need that change to happen. And so we need Colin to take his knee. We need Jay to be at the table. Ownership is something that has eluded us since the beginning of time. To the point where now, in basketball and football, college and pro, still fighting for presidents, GM, coaching jobs. How many black um, Division I football head coaches are there? Like four or five? How many, how many owners are there in professional sports that are African-American? Michael Jordan is the only one? Uh, Magic Johnson. And Magic Johnson, yep. depending on his situation with the Lakers. So I got to be the greatest of all time. Well, the, the Dodgers, right? Yes, correct. Good point. Yeah. But just, just, just think about that visual. I have to be the greatest of all time <laughs> <laughs> to be one of the 32 owners where 31 could probably walk down the street and you wouldn't even know who they are. So that, to me, is the paradigm shift that Jay-Z can have an influence on. And we've learned you can have 30 people put up the money. You can have three people put up the money. You can have one person put up the money for a team. They still got to let you in. It ain't even about the money. They still got to let you in. They have to give you permission. Do you think that... Him not getting a team right now was the backlash over the halftime show situation. I think. Do you think those two things are related? No, I just think teams aren't readily available. Which one? Well, it was a Pittsburgh Who's for Steelers. Sale? The Steelers is the the rumor that I heard. All right, but when when the games start on September fifth, we're gonna be talking about the Rooney Rule and how. They've been terrific owners of the team and how they've been able to keep it as a family business for generations on generations and generations. I would personally be surprised to see that change. I remember when people were having a conversation about James Dolan should or is going to sell the team. Why, why would he do that? It's a family business. All he has to do is wake up in the morning. Well, you stayed in the league for 13 years. Andrew Luck recently retired. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you retired? 33, 34. 33, 34. He's 29. 20, 29. Now, football is not basketball. Correct. You take a lot more damage. Yep. And you really put the safety of your future at Every risk. Play. Every play. Mm -hmm. He walked away from $500 million. In theory. In theory. Did that surprise you at all? No. Because athletes today are smarter. Mm. Like th this idea of all of us that are 35, 40 and older of what we remember an athlete to be when the pads were bigger and the, the, they had more, um, the, had a bigger face mask and more thigh pads and like it was, it was a rough and tumble game as I remember it. And it was great when my favorite players like Ronnie Lott or I love DBs or David Fulcher or Joey Browner or, you know, Jack Tatum and guys like Night Train Lane, go across the lane, go across the, the field and, and, and level somebody or Lawrence Taylor. That used to get celebrated in football as big hits. Now, as you get awareness and I'm watching the game and somebody take a big hit, I'm like, ooh. Yeah, man. I mean, Lou Gehrig disease is a is a serious thing. You see, you see these older NFL guys fucked up. Yes, yes. And, fucked and, but, up. But and, and we have decades of history on what those concussions can do to you. Uh, for watching NFL players run as fast as they can to hit each other as hard as they can, and the play's not over until the football is down. We've seen that for decades, right? What do you think gonna happen with MMA? As it yeah, now has with, become mainstream. Yeah, with those tiny gloves, taking hits in the face, taking kicks to the face. 
Uh, and they've tried to clean up the rules. I remember the original UFC. Remember Brutal. that? Brutal. You could kick a person in the face while they're down. Yeah, Perfectly brutal. legal. Knock out a tooth. No big <laughs> brutal. deal. Brutal. No weight classes back then. Correct. Remember that? How about that? <laughs> How about that? There was literally no weight yes. classes. A 300-pounder could fight a 100-pounder. Yes. Just to see what would happen. Rest in peace, Kimbo Slice. He was like, yo, yeah. from the backyard to the ring. Exactly. And didn't do too well, though. No. Nah. When he got there. Nope. It's, a whole, it's a whole different game. Yes. Um, If you were to name... Your top five NBA players of all time. I know you put Michael Michael Jordan one My through five. MJ is number one. But if you were if you go one through five with different people. Okay, MJ number one. Who's two? It's controversial, but going Kareem. Kareem Abdul Jabbar. Number two. Okay. So, so I, I I need to give some information behind these picks first. Okay. Jordan number one, six championships, six Finals MVPs, mm -hmm. never would be done. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar won four championships in high school, won three in college, won six in the NBA, won six MVPs, is currently, right now, the NBA's all-time leading scorer and arguably the most unstoppable shot ever in the Scott Hood. There's never been duplicated. Boom. Number three. I want to go Bill Russell. Okay. 11 championships in 13 years. Okay. Number four, and this, I just argued about this the other day, Magic. Magic Johnson. Magic. Okay. We... Only 6'9 point guard out there, <laughs> jumping center as a rookie, having a triple-double with 40. Okay. We still haven't heard Kobe or LeBron being mentioned. I, I'm, I'm thumb wrestling in that five between giving LeBron the edge over Larry. Larry Bird. So you wouldn't put Kobe in there? Yeah, Kobe in there. Kobe like around six or seven. Kobe in there. Okay, so who would you Will put? Will in there too. Okay. If I had to just name them without putting them in a quick order so well, I wouldn't forget Okay, well, anyone. so who would you put at five? I'm going to give LeBron no. <laughs> this is tough. Five, that's a tough spot, man. Yeah. Because there's no more after that. That's dead. <laughs> you got to eliminate dead. somebody. That's tough. How about I go, uh, I don't know. I'll go LeBron. LeBron. You want to keep going through 10? Sure. Who's six? LeBron, five. Bird would be six? Bird, six. Okay. Bird, for those that don't know, won consecutive, won three straight MVPs in the league. With the Showtime Lakers and Michael Jordan and the Bad Boys present. Mm. Three straight MVPs. MVP. Um, so you would say that was the baddest white boy ever? In the no question. It's not even <laughs> yes. No doubt. Okay. No doubt. Okay. Seven. And he coached me for three years in Indiana. Right. How about that? Exactly. Seven. Seven. Kobe hasn't gotten mentioned yet. Seven is Kobe. Seven is Kobe. Seven is Kobe. Got three slots left. Eight. Eight is, uh, let me just throw some names out there first so I'll make sure I don't forget nobody. I'm thinking about Will. I'm thinking about Big O. I'm thinking about Shaq. I'm thinking about Hakeem. There's Iverson. Iverson, Big O. Um, I would say... Wilt is uh what eight? Is that where we are? We got mm -hmm. Kobe seven. Kobe seven. Wilt eight. Okay, Will Chamberlain is eight. There's nine and ten. Nine. You know, there's Shaq, there's Kevin Durant. Mm. Nine is Shaq. Nine is Shaq. I ain't say Wilt yet. You said Wilt. Yeah, uh, Wilt Will was, was. Oh, Wilt was there. Okay. Yeah. And, and 10 is the big O. Oscar Robertson. Okay. That's 10. That's going to be a controversial list. Yeah. Because I, I left out a Keem. I was trying to get a Keem on there. <laughs> I was trying to get a Keem on there. That's a that's a unordinary list there. 
I was trying to get Akeem on there. Okay. Well, now you being a hip hop head, mm -hmm. top ten rappers of all time. Ooh. I know you said Jada Kiss is top ten. You said that before. This is extremely controversial. <laughs> so, uh, so there are gonna be people to see this and 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 see my rap music um, range for the first time. So it's important for me to give them some game. Right. It's kind of hard to do this. You and I are the same age, by the way. We were born in the same year. Oh, you were born in the Okay. 73. So, exactly. I'm like, I, you're, so you're, it's like. You're a few months old. So I understand the breadth. We've seen it all from the beginning to now. Yes. A 30-year-old will not have the same list that you and I Correct. have. Correct. So go ahead. No particular order first? No, no, no. We're not doing that. All right. We're doing order. <laughs> we're doing order. Okay. Number one. Wow. 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 Okay. I'm about to seriously do this for the first time in my life. Let's do it. On Vlad TV. On Vlad TV. Number one greatest rapper of all time. Jay-Z. Okay. That's one. Number two, two and three, Pac and Big. Who's two and who's three? Pac is two. Okay. I put Pac as my number one, but number two is good too. Yeah. Biggie's three, who's four? Four. Wow. I've never had to choose between these two guys. Hmm. This is controversial. In my heart, in my head. You're asking me SAT questions. Yeah. I love it. Um, my next two, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out which one I could put in front of the other one. How about four is uh four is Nas. Okay. Five. Eminem. Six. Six is, uh, I gotta just say some names to get me thinking. So this is not the order yet, just naming some people to get me thinking. Okay. I gotta mention uh, KRS, Rakim, um, LL. What about groups? You could put in a group, but that's where it gets a little bit hazy. Right, so I can't be like. But but you but you but I can say Andre You can name, you can name a rapper in a group. I'll give you that. Okay. You can name a rapper in a group, but you can't name the whole group because that kind of gives people an, an edge. Gotcha. You know. Okay. You can say Public Enemy, and it's like uh, right. It's Flavor Flav and right. Chuck D. You right. know. Right. But you can say Chuck D by himself. If you um. We're we're on seven. We're on seven. So I said Nas, Marshall, six. Seven. We're on seven. Who was six? No, this is six. Wait, this is six? Yeah, Nas and... Uh... Jay-Z, Tupac, Biggie. Ah that, that's the ones you've named. Uh, Nas, Nas, Marshall. Eminem. Damn it. That's it. I only did those five. We're only on six? Yeah. Six. Oof. KRS one. Okay. Seven. I gotta be in there. I feel like, I feel like we missed somebody, but Rock him. Okay. Eight. Mmm. You didn't know I was gonna take this so serious, did you? <laughs> As a hip hop head, I thought you would. Oh, okay. I am not surprised one bit. Wow. And I'll I'll tell you my list afterwards because I actually did yeah. one and I posted. But, it. But, but but tell me if I'm forgetting somebody that's obvious. That's obvious. I mean, there's Kendrick. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. There's Drake. Oh, yeah. There's Andre 3000. There's Wayne. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's oh, DMX. Man. There's 50 oh, Cent. Yeah. Oh, oh, There's LL Cool J. There's Chuck D. The there's Locks. Fun. Yeah, there's Jadakiss. Mm. There's Black Thought. Mm-hmm, love them. You know? 
Slow down. There's, there's a lot of important people out there. Oh, wow. All right. What number are we on? <laughs> I like how you did that. So, so that was seven? I've done seven? Or this is number seven? I think this is eight, but we'll, we'll just go with the seven. Fuck it. Okay. So <laughs> The like, comments can work it out later. Right. Um, I said Carriers one. Sarah Rock Kim. But there's J. Cole, there's Easy E. There's Big Daddy Kane. Big Daddy Kane. Melly Mel. Yep. Melly Mel gotta be in there. Okay, so that's eight. Wow. Or seven? I love Let's the just message. say seven. Yeah, the message boy. Okay. Um So there's three more, eight, nine, ten. Okay. How about we go? I gotta put the locks in there as a collective. I no, let them know. No, no, you got you get one more, you get one out of those. I'm gonna say it's Jadakus because you named Jadakus before. Unless you want to give it to to Styles or or She. That's hard for me to separate. <laughs> They're all so dope. Um, I mean, you could get, you could put them in consecutive order if you want. <laughs> Eight, nine, ten. Yeah, you can. Yeah, exactly. There you go. I see why this is a tough exercise. Yeah. Um. I just gotta have the locks. Okay. There, there, there goes your eight, nine, ten. Then. No, all right. Unless you want to switch it. All right. Uh, you gotta knock one of them out. Their feelings are gonna be hurt. Sheik is gonna be like, God damn it, man! How come you motherfuckers never mentioned me in this shit? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck y'all. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So you're gonna put Jada Kiss? Or, or I mean, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth here. No, I really love the locks. Like okay, that. so there you go, locks eight, nine, ten. There goes no, your ten. No, they won. Let's just let them be one. No, they, they can't. Really be, they cannot be one. They all have independent projects on separate. top of it. How do you separate the locks? Hey, man, you can separate the Beastie Boys. You can separate Public Enemy. You can separate Tribe Called Quest. Mm-hmm. You can separate De La Soul. I forgot about J Cole. I love him too. Right. So you're going to take someone out the locks as eight? I can't split up the locks. All right. The locks are eight, nine, ten. There you go. So who is the list? So who did I get? Jay-Z, Tupac, Biggie, Nas, Eminem. And then the last, I'm starting to forget because that was right. Nas, down. Eminem, KRS. KRS One, Melly Mel. Big Daddy. Big Daddy, well... Well, I then, didn't say Big Daddy. No, you didn't say Big Daddy. Then, then the locks. Oh, right, let me get a top 12. So if you if you allowed me to do it, I would have made the locks eight. I was going to make Drake, Kendrick, Cole, Kane. There you go. That's your top 15 or so. <laughs> My top 10 was Tupac. Slow down. Okay, Tupac. Yep. Biggie. Uh huh. Ice Cube. Oh, I left off Cube. No doubt. No. I gotta put Cube on there. That's the obvious one. Right. Cube is the obvious one. Okay. Jay Z. Yup. Easy E. Yup. Kanye. Not on mine. Kendrick. On oh, mine. J Cole. On oh, mine. Nas. Definitely on mine. And Drake. You got a real list. Top 10 list. You got a real list. I got to have Cube on mine. Yeah. So Cube is my bonus. That's my brother. <laughs> well. And LL. And LL Cool J. There's Muscle so Bob many. Man and put oh, there's KRS-One. On there's KRS-One on your list also somewhere yeah, in there. Yeah, so. KRS on there too. Listen, Jalen Rose, man. This was an epic interview that I've waited a very long time to do. Thank, Thank you, you so much for coming in. Uh, man, this was literally one of my favorite interviews ever. And since we're talking about Detroit, I have to say this because you asked me about my list. Right now, I know this is probably going to be controversial. I want to make sure I say this right. All I know is this. A lot of cities have had their turn. Right, where we felt like, okay, they're the epicenter of touching all of the bases of greatness in hip hop and in rap music. Right now, I feel like Detroit is amongst that category right now. I can see that. I can see that Big Sean is popping. We, we, got, we got Marshall, we got Big Sean, we got T Grizzly, we got Royce, mm-hmm. 
they covering all of the bases. Plus, you got the the new breed of kids. I mean, you mentioned T Grizzly. There's uh, uh, you know, Bang Gang. Uh, there's uh, uh, I forgot I forgot some of these other names, but <laughs> you're gonna kill me over this. But there is a whole breed of new street rappers kind of coming out of us. Uh, so, De- so world. Detroit, it's our turn. That's what it is. I've sat back and respectfully saw. The, the Pioneers, New York, have their turn. The West Coast had their turn. I love Atlanta. I love seeing them have their turn. The South had their turn. It's Detroit's turn right now. Stand up. What up, dog? That's what it is. Jalen Rose, until next time. Peace.